Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thank you for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. Today, we're highly privileged to be joined by one of the really leading uh, foreign policy thinkers in the United States, Elliot Cohen. Uh, Elliot is the Dean of Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. Um, is a, uh, a native of Boston, uh, grew up there, went to Harvard as an undergrad and also grad, and also taught there for a number of years. He's had other teaching assignments, including at the, um, the uh, Army War College and the Naval War College, and has been a professor at Johns Hopkins Sice since 1990. Uh, he's a prolific author, has written a number of wonderful essays and articles. I actually have two of his books on my bookshelf, which I've read, and I would highly recommend Supreme Command, which we will talk about for a few minutes, and also The Big Stick, which came out just a couple of years ago, which we will talk about. Um, Elliot is a contributing writer for The Atlantic and has written some wonderfully provocative articles that I look forward to discussing. I should also add that he's had several stints in government. He's worked in the Defense Department and also served as a senior advisor to Condoleezza Rice during her last two years as Secretary of State. So with that kind of introduction, Elliot, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, uh, John. Thank you for that, uh, that gracious introduction. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, Elliot, let's start maybe with, uh, I mean, your story is long and rich and interesting, but let's start at, at, when, you, when you arrived at SICE in 1990. Uh, tell us what, uh, under, under sort of what uh, auspices you arrived. I think you were ready to launch the Strategic Studies Program. Is that right? Right. So, uh, well, actually, I'll, I, I will tell you that um, being a professor at SICE is the only job that I ever really actively wanted. Um, I was at that time I was teaching at the Naval War College, uh, and there was a vacancy in the kind of national security area at SICE. I, I had encountered SICE as a graduate student. Uh, I was working for my, my old mentor, Sam Huntington, who ran a seminar together with the then Dean of SICE, Bob Osgood. And, um, I just remember, you know, meeting some of the faculty and, finding out about the school, I said, boy, that's the kind of place I'd like to end up. Uh, and then it's actually, sadly, Bob passed away. Uh, and so actually now I hold the Bob Osgood chair. When I came to SICE, I, I had been working in the US government as uh, I'd gone from the Naval War College to work in the, what was then a brand new um, organization, the policy planning staff in the defense department. There had been a state department policy planning staff, not one in defense. And um, they, uh, you know, I took the job at SICE. It was a fascinating time because the Cold War was uh, clearly coming to an end and nobody really knew what was next. And in fact, I'm, I've been told by uh, older colleagues that uh, they weren't even sure whether they really needed anybody in the national security field because, I mean, that was really the past and uh you know the world was going to be globalization and and then of course Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait um and since then unfortunately there's been a need for my services uh, but I built a, a program then uh eventually was asked to serve as vice dean and now I'm now I'm the dean of the place well one of the innovations in, in the security program as I understand it is uh uh, kind of an institution called Staff Rides. Tell yeah. us about that, how that works. So when I uh, came to the school, there, there had been a very active national security program, which had fallen away after uh, Professor Osgood had passed. And there, it was like a, I don't know, 16, 17 people left in it. it, it uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And I wanted to do something to... Um, you know, build up morale. And I had heard about staff rides. So staff rides are a military instructional technique. It started like many things with the Germans in the 19th century, but the US Army really picked up on it in the 30s and then again after Vietnam. And the idea is you go to a battlefield and you treat it as a, a kind of case study on the ground of decision-making. So it's not a battlefield tour. You know, you're not simply trying to figure out what happened, although that's part of it. Instead, what you're trying to do is to figure out who made what kind of decision, when was it a good decision or a bad decision and why? 
And it's driven not by having an expert showing you around, but rather by everybody, including the leaders, uh, playing roles. So you're, you know, you're uh, General Sickles at uh, Gettysburg. Why are you on um, uh, this ridge rather than the one half a mile back where you're supposed to be? And you're, so you get up and you try to explain, this is why I did it. And then you have arguments back and forth in role. And then at the end of the day, you try to pull it all together. So I had a, I had a student, I'd heard about that. I said, well, there, there must be a manual for this. Turns out the army, of course, has a manual for everything, including how to mop a floor. So they had a manual for doing staff rides. Uh, so I found it. And working with a student who was a Civil War buff, we started by doing one to Bull Run, which wasn't that far away. Well, over the years, this thing has grown. So they're now, we do them for at least two days, one each in the fall and sp in spring. And then we began doing them internationally. We've done them for almost 20 years. And we've had, and those are week long trips, uh, all organized by the students, by the way. And they're extraordinary uh, adventures. They're extremely intense. And we've done everything from the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, uh, to the Monte Cassino campaign, to the uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie and the rising of the 1745 in Scotland. And each time you just come away flooded with insights into leadership, uh, organizational psychology, many, many things. And it's a, it's a terrific, learning opportunity for all of us, but most definitely including the faculty. Well, I've seen some interviews in which you've described uh, your, your relationship with students and you say that when you encounter them, you say, okay, you got a lifetime warranty, you know, whenever you need me, uh, you know, check in. And you, you tell some wonderful stories about being in some of the most exotic places in the world and someone coming up and saying, Professor Cohen, I'm not sure you remember me, but I was in your 1994 strategic studies class. Mm -hmm. Tell us about just your relationship to SAI students and how that has really enhanced you as well as the students. Well, you know, I mean, I've, I've done a number of things in my, uh, in my professional life. I'm counselor of the State Department. I was reserve officer in the military. Um, you know, obviously I like to think I'm a scholar and a writer, but first and foremost, I've been a teacher. And uh, there's nothing quite like the the exhilaration when you see lights go on uh, in the classroom and you bring together many different kinds of students. That's one of the wonderful things about SICE. We have students who are essentially in their senior year in college. We have a BAMA program with uh, the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences at Hopkins. And then we'll have people who are well along in their careers. I, I remember I once had a, a work group, uh, which I created to do a, a project in a course and it consisted of a BA MA student. So, you know, somebody who's probably about 21, um, a Australian brigadier general who is uh, now one of the senior people in their military intelligence establishment and uh, Nick Schifrin, who's now the diplomatic and national security correspondent on the news hour. And I had the three of them working on a project and it was just wonderful to watch because they were all learning from each other. You know, it's just, they're just a, a, a tremendous mix. And one of the great joys of teaching at SICE is you do keep on encountering your students. When I was counselor, I was traveling all over the place, but mainly to some of the hard places, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I will, uh, you know, I'll never remember. I was, I never forget rather, I was, um, in the Northwest frontier province of Pakistan on the edge of the federally administered tribal areas. And, you know, all of a sudden you hear this voice say, hi, Professor Cohen, remember me? <laughs> and it was a former student of mine who was doing wonderful work for USAID uh, in, in some pretty wild places. And that's, uh, it's just a source of great joy. It really is. Well, you have talked about just your approach to teaching in which, you know, obviously rigor and analysis are key, but I've heard you encourage students to have kind of a playful, exploring dimension, arguing that in graduate school, this is going to be the time in your life where you have some, uh, some kind of space to do some things that maybe you're not going to want to do, you know, further along your professional career. Talk about that a little bit. 
Well, you know, I think it was Bertrand Russell who once said that a, um, a philosopher is someone who asks childlike questions in a serious way. And um, there's also in, uh, I think this is a concept maybe from Zen, the of beginner's mind, that you know, being able to put yourself in a position where you're, you're just taking everything afresh, like a, the way a child would. Um, and the, the older we get, the less playful we are. Um, and that's a problem. And, and in particularly, you know, given the subject that I teach, sort of national security kinds of things, primarily, not exclusively, you, you can, it's easy to become rather conventional in how you think about things and rather um, unwillingness to press. And I, I tell my students, this is your moment. You know, no, if you get something wrong, nobody's gonna die. There isn't gonna be a war that otherwise wouldn't happen. Um, I may just give you a hard time or somebody else may give you a hard time in class, but that's, that doesn't kill anybody. And, and so throw yourself into it and be playful. And I, it's, um, if you can do that, I think it's a tremendously liberating experience. And then you can go back to be, being very, very serious. And I've, you know, I've had many military students over the years, including um, the current commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, and I think that approach has worked with all of them. You know, they've learned to look at things from a fresh perspective. Well, you um, uh, have, have presided over uh, CISA's 75th anniversary. And, uh, you know, as you were saying before, you know, it's been constricted by, by COVID, of course. But in, in some of it, you, you had a big event, I think it was in October of 2019, where you said, you know, the school stands at a watershed. I mean, you've had a 75 year history, but you're looking, you know, into the future. You're about ready to move into, in a year or two, a remarkable new mm -hmm. facility. Um, and actually, I want you to play off this. You, were, you, you quoted Churchill, you said, First, we shape our buildings, and then our buildings shape us. Talk about that and how that relates to this new facility that sites will be moving into sure. very close to the Capitol. So for those of you who know Washington, D.C., you may know something called the Museum, uh, which is closed now, but it's been acquired by Hopkins. The building has. It's 555 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's equidistant between um, uh, uh, Capitol Hill and the White House. It's right on the mall. It's a spectacular location. It, it's, it's going to shape us in a number of ways. Uh, one of which is at the moment we're in a beautiful neighborhood on Massachusetts Avenue right next to a whole bunch of think tanks, but we've got three buildings which were not built to be academic buildings uh, and they're separated by two major thoroughfares. And the result is it, it tends to fragment the school. You know, people are not bumping into each other a lot. Uh, Ch Churchill did take this very personal interest, you know, in buildings, including the rebuilding of the House of Commons after it was bombed during World War II. And he, he, one of the things he said is, it's really important that it was always overcrowded so that there was a feeling of intimacy about it. He said, you know, they, I think the, uh, there's only enough seating for about two thirds of the, uh, uh, members of the House. And he thought that was very, very, very important to maintain that. Well, this is going to be a big advantage for us that you'll, we'll be um, interacting with one another much more, and that's going to be critical. But I think there'll be several other benefits. One is there'll be other parts of the university will be there, um, like the, uh, uh, the, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, the Cary School of uh, Business, they'll be part of the School of Arts and Sciences. And, and part of our future is greater collaboration with other parts of the university and bringing all the strengths of Hopkins to bear. The other thing is, of course, technologically, it's gonna be a terrifically advanced building. You know, we all, I mean, we're in older buildings and yeah, we've got computers and cameras and stuff, but this will really be world-class um, information technology. And, and that's going to enable us to do even more by way of things like uh, virtual teaching, hybrid teaching. We have as well, you know, these two overseas campuses, one in Bologna, Italy, and one in Nanjing, China. One result of COVID is we're actually doing more with our satellite campuses 
than than we ever have before because we're all on Zoom. And when you're on Zoom, you're all equal and you can teach across campuses and so on. The, the larger, um, if, I, if I could just riff a little bit on our 75th, um, you know, for me, the center, as I thought about that occasion, the, the critical moment is our founding. So the school was founded in 1943. We only became part of Hopkins in 1950. And it was founded by two remarkable young men, Christian Herter and Paul Nitze, both of whom, one a uh, Republican, one a Democrat, both of whom had very, very distinguished careers in public service. And the thing is, they they knew that um, the United States was going to play a much larger role in the world after World War II than it had before. And the United States would take on big responsibilities. There was a lot they didn't know. They didn't know about the atom bomb. They didn't know about the Cold War. But, but they could see a lot of big changes happening. The end of the European empires, uh, for example, and uh, or the rise of the Soviet Union. And they built a school and they designed a school which was intended to prepare young people for that world. And what I said at our 75th is we are actually at a similar kind of moment. There are things we can't foresee. You know, I, I certainly did not foresee a pandemic that would really shut the world down uh, when I was giving that speech. Uh, and God only knows what else lies before us. But we know that it is a transformed world. We know China's arrived. We know there are these transnational kinds of issues like uh, climate change. We know that America's relative power position is, has changed. And it's our job to create a school that's preparing people to face those challenges. Um, and that's producing the scholarship that will inform how we address those challenges. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tremendously important period for the world, but it, it's important for us. I'll, I'll say one other thing, which is um, when the school was founded, international was over there and we were over here. Now, international is everywhere. You know, coronavirus is in the United States. You know, it wasn't very long before it jumped from China to the United States. Uh, climate change doesn't particularly respect boundaries. You know, even various forms of conflict don't uh, respect boundaries as we found out on 9-11. So we're in a, it's just a very different international order. And I think wrestling with that is gonna be the task of the next couple of decades. Well, let's talk about your writing, because I know one of the things that you have told students at SICE is the importance of being able to write for different audiences. And, you know, as I was telling someone, I mean, I think you're sort of the classic triple threat in terms of, you know, very, very rigorous scholarly articles, mm -hmm. books that are, are very appropriate and very stimulating for you know, the general audience who are interested in, in, in nonfiction and, and, and your, your work with The Atlantic, which I want to get to in a second. But, but in terms of the book, I was, I was thinking of Supreme Command, which I read some years ago. And it was a wonderfully, a, a wonderful attempt to challenge kind of conventional thinking where we tend to think that, you know, strong political leaders, you know, give a couple broad directions to generals and then just get out of the way and let them fight the war. In your book, you show that actually, you know, that people like a Lincoln and Churchill took a very, very different approach to that uh, civilian military relationship. Could you talk about that for a sec? Sure. So uh, I think sometimes the best books originate out of a sense of being puzzled by something. Uh, so I was teaching at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. So this is not the Naval Academy. These were relatively senior officers, commanders and captains in the Navy. Um, you know, lieutenant colonels or colonels in the other services. And I realized that what we were teaching them about um, civil military relations uh, was that really that what was supposed to happen was the civilians were supposed to set some very broad guidance, maybe pick the most, the top commander, uh, maybe set, you know, some lanes at either on either side and then get out of the way and let the military experts do their thing. And the puzzle was that the more I read about great wartime leaders, it became very clear to me that that's not what they did. I mean, it's utterly not what they did. 
And I wrote a book to try to explain to myself, well, again, what were they doing exactly? Um, so it, it ended up, it's not a book about pistol whipping generals. Uh, it's, it is a book that explores some of the different modes of civilian control, whether it's, um, and not just civilian control, but how, how civilians can end up shaping strategy, what kinds of decisions they get involved in, which kinds of decisions, you know, they don't get involved in. And, and you know, in a way it's a book about judgment because it, it turns out there are no hard and fast rules about what details are important. So I, I think in the chapter I have on Churchill, I talk about one case where he was intervening to shape a decision about uh, how fast some of the convoys should sail between uh, the UK and North America. There, they had two different kinds of convoys, fast convoys and slow convoys. And you're going, well, you know, why should he be deciding, you know, whether a convoy should sail two knots quicker or not? The, the answer is uh, there were some very large considerations of risk. Uh, there are similar, similar kinds of decisions where he's making a decision about should they send a couple hundred tanks to the Middle East through the Mediterranean, which would be perilous. Um, and it turned out there was, again, a calculation of risk. I mean, what happens if the Germans invade? What, you know, what are the chances of losing those tanks? Other kinds of decisions you don't get involved in. Um, and so it's, it was an exploration of that. I, uh, I, it's actually the book I'm proudest of. It's still in print. Uh, it's still on a lot of reading lists. Um, I've been told by ministers of defense and secretaries of defense and chiefs of staff uh, of militaries around the world that they've read it and it, uh, it's informed how they've behaved. Uh, so that's, I mean, what more can an author ask for? Well, and I love, I mean, the one quote I, that resonated for years for me was Churchill saying, it is always right to probe. Mm. That's, that's true for deans as well, you know. <laughs> uh, I've, 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 I've learned. I, um, it, you know, it's actually one of the things that's been good about being a dean is being in a position of pretty high level authority. You know, you, you have a little bit more intuitive sympathy with, um, I mean, obviously it's not like leading a country at war, but you know, you begin to realize not all the information gets to you. You got to go out and fight for it. Let's talk for a second about your book, Big Stick, which, uh, which came out at a time when there was a, a lot of literature dealing with, you know, so-called soft power and just the importance of persuasion and example and so forth. And as I recall reading your book, I mean, you don't dispute the importance of soft power, but just said, for a lot of the challenges that the United States will be facing in this coming world, including the rise of China, threats from a Russian Iran, you know, protecting the cyber uh, world and, and so forth, outer space, that a strong military component is needed and should be more fully appreciated. Yeah. So the, yeah, I mean, the, um, I mean, the first thing you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's not that I'm against soft power in any way, far from it, just the reverse. I think it's, it's, it's actually a critical part of America's national strength. It just, uh, I try to remind people of its limits. So, you know, people sometimes talk about the fact that English is the universal language as a source of American soft power and in a way it is. But then again, um, you know, the universal language in the 18th century was French and it didn't prevent the British from repeatedly going to war with France and France coming out at the short end of the stick or, you know, and I feel this as an educator very much, that the American university system and higher education, ab absolutely a source of soft power. But let us remember that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, got his bachelor's degree in the United States. So you gotta be careful about what it is that you expect from soft power. The, the origins of that book were that it, it has seemed to me that, again, we were at a, a kind of a watershed. Uh, you know, we had a period that my, my late 
lamented colleague uh, Fuad Ajmi called the Great Picnic. Uh, from the end of the Cold War, certainly through 9-11, but I, in many ways beyond 9-11, where American power was just so overwhelming that um, we could do whatever we wanted, including making plenty of mistakes. And the book was written at a time when I said, we've got to come to terms with the fact that uh, that power is no longer overwhelming. China has arrived. It's not rising, it's, it's here. Uh, we have a number of hostile nation states that are um, out there and are more adroit in many ways about the use of force than we are. That's how I rate the Russians. We have a, a threat from uh, jihadists, which is not gonna go away. Uh, and which will be out there for a very, very long time, uh, maybe even a century or more. Uh, and then finally, we have what I, you know, I taking a, a phrase from Alfred Thayer Mahan, talk about the defense of the commons, and that is things like cyberspace. Uh, but it, it's more than just cyberspace. You know, we're, we're learning the hard way, I think, that um, the information space is a contested realm. You know, we're no longer... It, there are always going to be, I don't know, QAnon and kind of conspiracy theorists out there. They would never have the platforms in the past that they've got now. Uh, and it's easy, as we've learned, for foreign powers to feed those. Again, they could always do that. You know, you could always, you know, countries have subsidized newspapers in other countries for a very long time. You can do that sort of thing a lot more effectively now. So basically, the book is about how do we think about those challenges. The, the conclusion was, this is all manageable, but we just need to be a lot smarter about how we do things. Well, let's talk about some of you writing for The Atlantic. Um, it's I know when I read The Atlantic, the first thing I check out is if there's an Elliot Cohen article. And, um, and I have to say, I think the first one you wrote was about a week or 10 days into President Trump's presidency. Yep. And I wanna read two or three sentences and have you comment. Um, you, you, this, you wrote, I think it, the article is dated January 29th of 2017. And this followed his, the president's inaugural, um, the dispute over the crowd size and many other things that we many have probably forgotten. But you, you, write, by, you write saying, precisely because the problem is one of temperament and character it will not get better, it will get worse. As power intoxicate Trump and those around him, it will probably end in calamity, substantial domestic protest and violence, the breakdown of international economic relationships, the collapse of major alliances, or perhaps one or more new wars even with China on top of the ones we already have. It will not be surprising in the lightest, slightest if his term ends not in four years or eight years, but sooner, with, in, but with impeachment or removal under the 25th Amendment, the sooner Americans get yet used to these likelihoods, the better. Pretty good uh, crystal ball you had. In well, I, 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 I didn't call all of them, but I, uh, I th I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, uh, of that piece. Um, I, I'd like to think that Paul Simon would have uh, uh, approved of it. it. You know, I met him once or twice. Uh, and of course, was very impressed by him. And it strikes me that's, you know, I suspect he might have had a similar sort of assessment. And it, you know, that the, I guess the thing I would say is that for me, the key really was character. You know, I, I helped organize these uh, two letters by uh, Republican foreign policy and national security figures during the campaign, one in, I think, March of 2016, one in August. Um, and the thing that struck all of us who were engaged in that effort was, you know, we obviously had concerns about Trump foreign policy, but the overwhelming concern was about Trump character. And, um, and character really matters. I think it was um, Heraclitus who said, character is destiny. And I really believe that uh, character is destiny. And, you know, we've seen, I mean, the calamity um, that we've seen is uh, a pandemic that was bound to kill quite a few Americans, unfortunately, but didn't have to kill this many, not more than a quarter million and 
you know, God only knows what it'll be before it ends. You, um, you struggled in this article too, with just, you know, what you would, what you would recommend to fellow Republicans in terms of serving in, in the administration. And you wrote, um, when you sell your soul to the devil, he prefers to collect his purchase on the installment plan. Reflect on that. Well, um, look, there are some extremely strong characters who I think came out unscathed. I think of Jim Mattis as Secretary of Defense. But, um, and, and, you know, there are different circumstances. If, you know, if you're going into the administration to be the Assistant Secretary of, uh, you know, Greenland Affairs, probably you're not going to be too, too damaged. But I, I had one person I knew who ended up quite high up who called me just before he had gotten the offer and he wanted my final advice before he went in. He was going to go in anyway, uh, but he did call me. And I you know, asked what I thought and I, I had a number of thoughts, but I said, the, the thing to remember is that the challenge to your integrity will not come when Donald Trump points at a crib and says, strangle that baby. It's going to be a lot more incremental than that. And I think that's, that's just not just a feature of um, this administration. I think that's, that's in the nature of what power and the desire to acquire power do to people. And in the final analysis, uh, this is something I've talked to my students about often. You have to make a somewhat arbitrary decision say, that's a line I just can't cross. Uh, there's a wonderful movie, which was also a wonderful play called A Man for All Seasons um, with a wonderful British actor, Paul Schofield, uh, playing Sir Thomas More and wrestling with his conscience as he deals with King Henry VIII, who wants basically his support to divorce his wife and marry Anne Boleyn. And there's just a moment where he, he, everybody's telling him to give in. And he, he turns to his daughter, um, who in the play and in reality was very highly educated and says, um, when, when a man takes an oath, he holds himself in his own hands like water. Um, and if he should ever open his fingers, he can never hope to find himself again. I've always thought that was a lovely way of putting it, that there's just, I think for, for people, there are all kinds of reasons why at some point you might say, okay, I'll go along with that. And then before you know it, you're, you're a different person than when you went in. And that, that, for me, that's the tragedy of some of the people I've known um, who went in, uh, had mixed, emotive, mixed motives, I'm sure, because they're human beings and human beings always have mixed motives. And they did not come out whole. I mean, they may come out rich, but they're not going to come out whole. You you write a couple months later about, and the context was just, you know, how things happen when you're in power that you don't expect. And you say, surprises are unavoidably what international politics is all about. What matters is how well an administration copes with them. Trump was lucky to avoid an external crisis in his first seven months. That luck will run out. Yeah, I think the luck ran out less in um, international. Um, well, the luck, to some extent, the luck ran out earlier in, in terms of dealing with China, I would particularly say. But, but fundamentally, where the luck ran out was coronavirus. Because, you know, there was a crisis which required all the qualities he doesn't have. B being able to master detail, he, he clearly is incapable of doing that. You know, listening to expert opinions, sifting it, deciding when to go along with it, when not to go along with it, which is, you know, that's part of leadership. That's actually part of what uh, Supreme Command was all about, dealing with the experts. But, but he, you know, not something he was capable of. Dealing with problems that are intangible rather than right in front of him. Dealing with problems that don't, can't yield to demagoguery. Uh, and he just completely failed that. So, you know, he ended up listening to crackpot scientists. He ended up going on this 
terribly stupid and destructive campaign against wearing masks when it's, it's abundantly clear that that's you know that's how you can save people uh encouraging people to do things that were unsafe and then getting them sick you know um that was that ended up being the the crisis i think he was actually extraordinarily lucky in the first couple of years of the administration that that sort of thing didn't happen in a different context well, in your writing, one figure who looms very, very large is William Shakespeare, who you refer to as the finest political psychologist of them all. Tell us, I mean, tell us how Shakespeare informs your, you know, your professional uh, ability to assess the world and to assess personalities and to, to, to do your job. Well, well, thank you for asking me that question. I'm going to, uh, while, while I'm talking, I'm going to call up a uh, document that you can do that when you're on a computer, which you can't do uh, in person, obviously. Um, and I'll, I'll, you'll see why in a moment. So actually, my next book is going to be, um, the book is going to be called Rough Magic, Shakespeare on Getting, Using, and Losing Power. Uh, and... It's, um, uh, I got the idea for it. Uh, we're, we're in Washington, DC, uh, we're very fortunate. We have, uh, we have not one, but two Shakespeare theaters. We have the Folger Library, which is probably the greatest collection of Shakespeareana in the world. And the Shakespeare Theater Company, which is a huge theater, which has some wonderful productions. And I went to see Henry VIII uh, with my wife, which is one of the more obscure plays. There was some dispute originally about whether Shakespeare read it. The, the thinking now is he probably did write it, although he might have had some help. But there's this great scene where the king's chancellor, uh, Cardinal Wolsey, has just been deposed. And Wolsey had really run the kingdom. And he gets up and he gives this great Shakespearean innovation, the soliloquy. That's where he's just kind of talking. Although later on, uh, Thomas Cromwell, his assistant, comes in. So, if we, would you mind if I if I read no, part no. of this a little clearer? Sure, here? go ahead. So he, he says, "Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes. Tomorrow blossoms and bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, a killing frost." And when he thinks good easy man, full surely his greatness is ripening, nips his root, and then he falls as I do. I have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth. My high blown pride at length broke under me and now has left me weary and old with service to the mercy of a rude stream that must forever hide me. And then at the, uh, uh, at, at, at the end, he's, he says, Oh, Cromwell, Cromwell, had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. And I, you know, I listened to that. And I went, I know that guy. You know, if you live in Washington, as, as you have, you, you know the Wolseys. That's the guys who've been flying high, um, they're really full of themselves. Everything is going their way. And what they're doing is they're swimming on a sea of glory. And then the, the bladder that they've been swimming on pops and all of a sudden they're swept away. And, and that one thing led to another. Um, I began teaching a course on, uh, on Shakespeare, which I'll be doing again in the spring. And it just, it just repeatedly strikes me how how extraordinarily insightful he is. You know, Shakespeare, he doesn't talk about political movements. He doesn't talk about ideology. That's not what, what he's interested in is the study of character. So you, you see the theme here. And he is a, a marvelous student of political character. And you have strong kings, you have weak kings, you have advisors, you, you have subordinates. And it just filled with insights um, and they don't go away. So the, the opening line of my book I've decided is going to be 
that it's one thing to read about Richard II and uh, Iago and Goneril or watch them on the stage. I've actually had to work with them. And, uh, and, and that makes it a little bit different. So uh, yeah, Shakespeare all day, I could bore you to tears with it. Well, another person who uh, maybe a, a cut below Shakespeare in terms of stature, but maybe not too much is Dwight Eisenhower. Yeah. And you write about the Republican Party at its best being, you know, kind of infused with the values of Eisenhower. Um, reliability, planning, thoughtfulness, reliability, honesty, et cetera. And you say that the party, in fact, you use the word that the, the Republican Party now is in ruins and you say, it is, impo it is impossible at this moment to envision the Republican Party coming back. What can be done to make the Republican Party more resemble the party of Eisenhower? I wish I knew. I, um, I, uh, I dropped my party registration um, the day after uh, Donald Trump was nominated. And the reason why is I, I'm afraid that this is, again, I think this is one I anticipated, that the party would basically bend its knee to, to Trump, including on matters of basic decency. I mean, I, let's set aside everything else. I mean, the moment, there were a number of moments where I realized I couldn't go along with, uh, have anything to do with, um, with Trump. For me, the, the absolutely decisive moment was when he went after John McCain who I knew pretty well and I traveled with him a bit um, and is, you know, was a genuine American hero. And was, he's, he's attacking John McCain, this incredibly heroic figure who has suffered enormously for this country and has served it to the best of his abilities, whether you agree with him or not on any given thing. You're turning on him. I mean, what kind of, and you, you draft dodger. I mean, how could this be? And unfortunately, the, the thing that I think I see when I see the Republican Party, with honorable exceptions like Mitt Romney, who I also worked for, um, is, you know, they just caved. They just gave in. They didn't stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This is deeply wrong. And, and unfortunately, it's not going to go away. I mean, I was really struck. I mean, um, I did some advising for Mark Rubio. He just sent out this kind of mean-spirited little tweet about sneering at Ivy League advisors. Well, guess what? I was one of his advisors and sorry, I went to Harvard. I uh, obviously forgot, as did most of his advisors, went to similar institutions. Uh, you know, he obviously forgot that one. Uh, but it's, you know, it's demeaning. It's small, it's petty. And I, I, I grew up in Boston and for me, the, you know, the, some of the great statesman-like figures were people like Ed Brooke. So Ed Brooke was the first African-American Senator since reconstruction. And he was a Republican. He was a Republican from Massachusetts. And there were a lot of that, that type. I mean, they were basically moderate people. They were kind of fiscally conservative. They were socially somewhat conservative but they were pretty upright kinds of figures. And I, um, I don't see it coming back. Uh, now I may be wrong and maybe, you know, as you get older, you get more pessimistic, but still. Well, we have some questions that people have sent in. Good. Uh, so some questions from, from, uh, from the Midwest. And actually the first one is from Philadelphia. Jan in Philadelphia says, how does the U.S. repair relations with its allies and fill the leadership vacuum created during the last uh, administration? And then he also asks uh, specifically U.S. relationships with both China and, and Russia. So that's... So uh, that's a multi-part question. Let me try to, uh, uh, try to wrestle with that. And, and, you know, at a superficial level, it's easy and it's already begun. You know, when... Um, <clears throat> you know, a, a prime minister of Great Britain or a German chancellor or a Australian prime minister um, look at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Tony Blinken, the secretary of state designate or Jake Sullivan, the uh, national security advisor designate, they, they see people they recognize, in many cases, literally people they know 
Uh, they know they're completely level-headed and uh, they don't hate allies, far from it. And I'm sure that the first thing that the administration will do is they'll just begin reaching out to people and saying, look, the old America's back. And that's, that's very basic uh, diplomacy. President, I'm sure, is, the president-elect, I'm sure, is doing it by phone calls. Uh, I'm sure they'll do lots of visiting. You know, the natural thing would be you go to the office for a couple of weeks and then you hop on a plane and you just begin to say, hey, we're back. We don't hate you. Uh, we want to reaffirm the value of these, these alliances. Uh, and that's absolutely what they should do because this, when you talk about soft power, I mean, the American alliance system is the greatest source of American strength uh, that we've got. At a deeper level, that's a lot harder though because... I think some of the true damage of the Trump era is it does call into question our judgment. Uh, there are people wondering, I mean, we, I think we can understand why he got Trump got as many votes as he did. I think a lot of other countries find that hard to understand. A lot of other countries are now aware that we have presidential elections where you can consistently lose the popular vote and still get elected president. And that does not make sense. I mean, I've got a colleague who's Brazilian. He's saying, you know, in Brazil, with all of its problems, which are considerable, we, we know, you know, who got the majority of votes and that person's going to get to be president. So, um, and, you know, we can get past that, but I, I do think some damage has been done. And I think it's, the thing is, it's coupled with the fact that the world is changing. The United States role is not going to be the role it was in 2000. I um, mean, it's we're in a different era. So there's that uncertainty that will be out there for some time. And, and uh, you know, the other thing is just the um, kind of the configuration of international politics has changed. So like in the Middle East, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is now the Arab-Israeli conflict is not really particularly important. What's important is the conflict between a coalition that's essentially driven by the Gulf Arab states, Israel, maybe Egypt, versus Iran, and to some extent versus Turkey. And this is a, this is a traditional geopolitics, just taking a somewhat different um, uh, form. Uh, with China, I think my... my prediction is that actually, um, first, I don't think everything the Trump administration did was wrong just because they did it. Um, I think some of the stuff they were doing on China was fine. A and in any case, I think structurally, we're, we're headed for a period of difficult relationships with China. On the one hand, there's trade and all that. On the other hand, um, you know, China sees itself as displacing the United States in large parts of the world. It is a much more uh, dictatorial kind of regime than we've seen in the past in China, to, in some ways to totalitarian, not just authoritarian. Um, and the incoming administration is going to care a lot more about human rights. So they'll care a lot more about Hong Kong. They'll care a lot more about the Uyghurs. Uh, they'll care a lot more about the suppression of dissent. I don't think the Trump administration particularly cared about those things. They, they weaponized them, but they don't think they cared about them all that much. So there's, there, there's that. So I don't actually expect U.S.-China relations to get any better. And, and the underlying issue, some of the underlying issues are real, theft of intellectual property, for example, that sort of thing. And then with Russia, I just think, I think the relationship was always difficult. The, the peculiarity of the Trump administration was... It's reminiscent of French diplomacy in the 18th century. In, in France in the 18th century, there would be official French policy. And then there was something called the secret du roi, which is the king's secret. And the king would have his own foreign policy. And sometimes it was completely opposed to what the foreign minister's foreign policy was. Well, that's kind of where we were with um, uh, the Trump administration on Russia. The, the institutional policy towards Russia was actually tough to the point of hostility. The president's policy towards Russia was friendly. And so, so the result was incoherence, which is sort of what you'd expect in that situation. I think you'll get coherence in a Biden administration. It'll be a disciplined administration with a disciplined leader. Um, and it'll be one that'll be pretty antipathetic to, the, to Russia. 
William from Carbondale asks, to what degree does the outgoing Trump administration's unwillingness to cooperate with the Biden transition team increase the national security challenges facing the country? Well, in, you know, in the very narrow sense, it did, but only marginally, uh, in that you know, the Biden team is very, very experienced, so uh, including Biden himself. So, okay, a couple of weeks delay in getting the president's daily brief, unfortunate, but not crippling. Um, the same thing for a lot of the, uh, the teams that would work in the State Department. I, I was involved in the Bush transition to the Obama administration, I know, from my own experience, you know, you can write lots of long briefing books and the new team comes in and they look at you pityingly and pretend to listen to you. And then they throw the briefers into the, the briefing books into the trash and do whatever they were gonna do anyway and make the same mistakes you did and then come to the same place. But, um, so I, I don't think that did damage, a huge amount of damage and eventually <coughs> the head of the uh, GSA, the, is what really matters here, essentially authorized uh, collaboration and, and you, you go from there. What, what is disruptive to national security um, in a deeper sense is, and again, this goes back to our reputation overseas, people having a sense that there's something very weird here going on where a president does not acknowledge having lost. There's something very weird here when, you know, crazed conspiracy theories are being spread. Um, that, that does tend to undermine national security. But I think in the narrow sense, it's not gonna make a huge difference to the transition. Bill from Chicago asks, what should be the foreign policy priority for President Biden in his first six months? What should be the initial uh, focus? So the first thing I, I would say is actually, everything I said say should be in the context of understanding that his first priority should not be foreign policy. His first priority needs to be staffing up uh, coronavirus, uh, coming up with an agenda that he'll be able to get through what may be a hostile Senate, figuring out where there is common ground on things like building infrastructure, um, doing the things both active and symbolic uh, to help bring the country together. Those, are, those have to be first order priorities. Um, and foreign policy, I hate to say it as a foreign policy guy, is secondary. As it, within, having said that, within the sphere of foreign policy, the most important thing is rebuilding alliance relationships. And um, understanding that that's, that will not in and of itself deal with all of our problems, very far, very far from it. Uh, but it's an essential precondition for beginning to shape a different kind of foreign policy for a different kind of world, which, which will be very, very hard to do. I mean, it's, that's going to be difficult, but, but you got to first, you got to stop the rot. You know, this is um, what you're trying to do is just stabilize the patient, uh, if you will. And then you can begin working on rehabilitation and, you know, doing the other things you want to do to really get the patient back up on its feet. I'd like to close with two, uh, two final articles you wrote in The Atlantic. And the first one was called A Tale of Two Letters. And, and it, you, you made reference to it earlier. You were one of the lead authors of a, a letter in March uh, of 2016 and then followed up in August, uh, you know, challenging Republicans not to support the president. There was another set of letter, letters that came out, I think, earlier this year, more from the left perspective. But you write, um, you write here, you say, you can cause a great deal of fuss by stating some obvious truths about someone's bad behavior and then affirming principles that a sixth grader can understand. <laughs> Talk about just you know, standing up and, um, you know, and dissenting and challenging you know, your base or the people that you've worked with throughout your professional career. Um. The motto of my university, Johns Hopkins, is veritas vos liberabit. The, the truth will make you free. And I believe that. And if there's anything to be said for intellectuals, uh, and there are things you can say against intellectuals, it should be that of all people, they should be the ones who say the truth. We're not a whole lot of good for other things. You know, we, we may not 
uh, be the people you want to have running a war, but um, or building a bridge, or that's what we should do. It, it is, in my case, actually, given the protections of tenure, and uh, given the fact that you know Hopkins, like most academic institutions, is a fairly liberal place, I found it easy. I mean, this was not. Now, I lost friends. I think all of us who are never Trump uh, Republicans lost a bunch of friends. And I don't think any of us really regretted it. I mean, that um, because at the end of the day, you know, what matters most is, and the way I thought about it is, you know, I've got a whole bunch of rather young grandchildren. Um, and I just had this mental image of one of them coming to me when they come home in spring break from their freshman year in college saying, grandpa, I've been, I've been learning all about the Trump administration. I, I mean, I was a little kid then and I, there was some pretty weird stuff going on. Did you have anything to do? And I, I want to be able to tell her, yeah, grandpa at least spoke up. There wasn't a whole much bunch else he could do. And so you feel good about that. I, I think this issue, the reason why I wrote that piece though, is because I think there will be other issues of this kind where it will be more difficult to speak up. And I've, you know, I've told, I've got friends on both left and right. And I have told friends on the left, your, your moment will come too. And it'll be harder for you, actually, um, than for me, where th things will be going on and you really need somebody to call it out and you have to be willing to lose friends. Uh, and you have to be willing to get the kind of, kind of poison pen emails and tweets and all that that you're going to get um, to stand up for what's right. Because we, our country is going to go, I believe, through a pretty difficult 10 or 20 years in which some very fundamental values of intellectual freedom and academic freedom of respect for the truth, uh, respect for one another, uh, compromise, those are all gonna be threatened. And you're gonna need a bunch of people who are willing to say, yeah, I'm gonna tick off everybody on my own side by saying this, but I'm gonna say it. Well, I'd like to close by reading a couple sentences of an article you wrote on October 18th. And you begin by saying national politics is unutterably depressing. International politics fills me with foreboding. Being a dean brings one challenge after another, reminding me that life was a lot simpler as a professor. For my physical health, there is the rowing machine. But for my peace of mind, I have learned this past year, nothing beats watching old episodes of the great British baking show, which one can bin watch on Netflix. <laughs> Tell us about that show. Oh, I forget how we came across it. Probably, I don't know whether it was through our kids, uh, but my wife and I just love it, as I think a lot of people do. And, uh, you know, as I said, in the, so first, like everybody else has been locked down during COVID. Uh, my wife does most of the baking and cooking, but I've begun doing a number of things, including making a really mean sourdough bread. I make, I, I make like really good sourdough bread. I mean, really good. Uh, and uh, we, we somehow began watching it. And the thing that I loved about it is, I mean, I'm, there's a certain kind of England of my imagination, which I know is not really the real England. And I think it's very important to have those kinds of places. Um, uh, yeah, as long as you recognize that it's somewhat whimsical. And the wonderful thing about, you know, the Great British Baking Show is, there, there are certain standards that are being upheld. And those of you who watch it will know that you, Paul Hollywood will just tell you that, you know, you've got a soggy bottom there, uh, referring to the your bake, uh, and you know it's a it's a mess and so on. But the bakers all help each other and kind of encourage each other, uh, and it's uh, and you know you watch average people do remarkable things. And I think it's, and you see, see people aspiring and trying and putting out every last uh, ounce of effort. And it also reminds you, and this is something that's really important for our mental health right now. There are things beyond politics. Politics has been occupying way too much of our headspace, you know, and uh, to find something that's completely apart from that, eh, it's a godsend. Well, to prepare for this interview, my wife and I watched an episode last night, and we're, we're utterly delighted. And I actually want to read uh, uh, how, how you concluded that article. You say, to watch the great British baking show, 
is to believe that the average guy and gal can do remarkable things, that good nature is compatible with excellence, that high achievement can be recognized, that honest feedback can lead to improvement, and that there are things in life beyond work, and is to believe that spectacular creativity can actually be scrumptious. <laughs> All true. That yeah, must have been fun to write those words on the keyboard. It, it is fun. Been- you know, I one of the reasons why I love The Atlantic is, um, you know, I write pretty serious things for the most time. But then I, 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 I uh, one of my columns, I describe playing hooky from a uh, very weighty conference on American foreign policy in order to go to a magic convention in Los, a- in Las Vegas, you know, with like a thousand whacked out magicians. I'm, I'm a not very good amateur magician. And just the joy of hanging around with a whole bunch of magicians doing really weird stuff with coins and cards and handkerchiefs and tubes and and being a 10 year old again, um, and, which is when I got hooked on magic. And I, uh, I, I mean, it goes back in a way, John, I think to what we were talking about earlier about being playful. That that's, you know, that's a critical part of our mental health, isn't it? It is. Thank you. Well, Elliot, we are utterly uh, delighted to have spent this time with you. Really enjoyed it. And uh, we'd love to get you to Carbondale, show you some Southern Illinois, maybe in the context of your book on on Shakespeare. We'd love to have you meet with students and uh, we can show you around, maybe find a magic show or something in St. Louis to... uh, to take your due, so I I would I would love that. So let me take that. I'm I uh, actually have a sabbatical coming up, and I'm going to be spending next year writing the book. So uh, I w- I would love to come and talk about Shakespeare. That and uh, and I'll I'll also take seeing the sights and maybe even taking in a magic show. That would be great. Well, thank you so much. Really delighted. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. Uh, The interview will be on our website uh, tomorrow and also on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for following us on social media. And thank you for keeping the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well.